go ahead and kick off. And I'm very excited to have here today Eduardo Nemni and Ziad Al Ashkar um, to talk about, well, what a war crime looks like from space. Um, and this is an issue that, of course, people have been working on for some time now. And so we thought it would be very good to explore what is some of the new innovation that's that's emerging in, in this field. Um, so welcome once again to another edition of our Data for Peace Dialogues, um, which is hosted by, by our center, the NYU Center on International uh, Cooperation. And as you know, because many of you have joined us in previous editions, this is a monthly webinar series that's organized as part of CIC's uh, Data for Peace Building and Prevention program. And the dialogues um, discuss examples and recommendations presented in our ecosystem mapping report, which we published in October of last year, um, where we really tried to highlight some of the cutting edge examples of data-driven technologies with the potential for positive impact on the peace building and prevention field. Now, one of these examples is satellite imagery and remote sensing, which is gaining more and more use in a lot of fields. Um, and of course, we're very interested to understand the potential in peace for peace building and prevention. So we did decide to um, devote this dialogue to the topic of use of this new technology in humanitarian settings for hum human rights protection and also for conflict prevention. So remote sensing technology and satellite imagery have seen a huge rise in popularity over the last decade with hundreds of satellites circling the earth. The insights from data have already proved its value for things like climate change tracking, agricultural development, disaster mitigation and recovery, and can also potentially be invaluable for the work of peace building and prevention practitioners um, and for human rights and humanitarian communities, especially in situations of restricted access to a conflict zone. So today, not only governments, but also international human rights organizations, civil society, and individuals um, have an abundance of observation data that's available to use. And what we see is the greater availability of imagery, and at the same time, new developments in machine learning, deep learning, and neural networks. So we will discuss the potentials of combining high quality satellite imagery, deep learning, and other advances in computer science um, that have transformed how we extract the information from images. So we are really thrilled to be joined by two experts in the field who are going to show us how their organizations apply remote sensing in their work, how the field has changed over the previous decade, because as I mentioned, this is, this is not a new issue, and what is the potential for positive impact in the future? So um, welcome to Ziad and to Eduardo. Um, and I am delighted to have both of you here. And I see that Branka has joined us back again. So maybe I'll say hello to Branka. Are you, are you online now? I am being speech for jumping in and my apologies for, for my uh, uh, very bad Wi-Fi today. I joined through the phone and I'm here now uh, and I'm also welcoming our guests uh, today. Welcome Eduardo and Ziad. Uh, and we had the, the latest change in the line of speakers. I don't know Paige if you mentioned this just to uh, uh, mention to, to our audience. Uh, Kathleen uh, from Signal Program on Human Security and Technologies unfortunately not able to join us today, but we are really lucky to have her colleagues, Ziad uh, Achkar, who is joining us from George Mason University uh, today to tell us a bit more about Signal uh, uh, program and the work uh, um, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative is working uh, in this field. Hi everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be able to join. And again, apologies for my uh, for my friend and colleague Caitlin Howers, who's not able to join us today. Um, so my name is Yad Ashkar. I'm currently a, a PhD candidate at uh, Jimmy and Rosalind uh, Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution, uh, where I really focus on the use of technology and digital tools uh, for humanitarians and peace building um, purposes, and 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 thinking about how do we use these tools in an ethical um, and responsible responsible way. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be able to come in and speak uh, today. I, I started my career 
really working at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative um, in really 2011, so about a decade ago now, um, on a small project at the time that was called the Satellite Sentinel Project. And the goal at the time was to use satellite imagery and remote sensing tools um, to document potential um, potential violence and potential conflict triggers that might erupt on the border region between Sudan and what is now South Sudan. And so for about 18 months, we had access to high resolution satellite imagery through a company called Digital Globe, uh, that's now called Maxar. Um, and the goal was to, was to use satellite imagery, combining it with information from the ground, news reporting, open source data, to monitor really um, what we what was a volatile region uh, and what was a region for that had a high spread of um, of violence, and so what we found throughout these eighteen months uh, period where we were involved at HHI um, was that this was a potentially really powerful tool and transformative um, type of uh, resources that were now accessible to to a broader uh, audience. You know, prior to maybe twenty ten or two thousand five. Most of these resources were very much limited to the intelligence community, the military community. But we saw, you know, starting in the mid 2000s into 2010, an explosion in access to commercial satellite imagery. And not only explosion in access, improvement, drastic improvement in the quality of imagery that you can get access to. So we went from having access to, you know, one or two satellites that can get you very high resolution sub meter. Um, imagery, which allows you to really see objects much more clearly, to be able to identify structures, to be able to identify um, vehicles and, and roads and bridges and infrastructures, um, to now having able having access to, to you know, a plethora of, of resources. One of the things that also happened in the US is that the US Congress uh, removed the limitation on the resolution that you can get access to. Um, prior to 2014, um, 15, it was um, a limit that you can only get access to 50 centimeter resolution. Um, and now that limit's been removed uh, to the point where you can get access from Maxar to 15 centimeter high resolution. So it's really an exciting time for the field. Uh, we've also seen at the same time a really rise in, in the use of drones. Uh, and um, again, moving from a military um, limited in intelligence gathering um, purpose to now being used by civil society groups, by humanitarian organizations, by local uh, organizations on the ground to do humanitarian response, to do mapping of, of damaged structures, and to, to be able to provide medical supplies um, to, to areas that you can't have access to. And so really, what, what is it the benefit that we get out of remote sensing? Um, and what are also, you know, a, what are some of the, the, the important things to keep in mind and some of the potential risks and harms that can be caused and so out of the experiences we had at, at SSP, we launched this program in 2012, the Signal Program at Human Security and Technologies, to really study, um, to really study this, to also build frameworks and guidelines and methodologies, and to advocate also for, for these ethical norms and, and, and to, to, to develop these guidelines for the whole sector. The work that we were doing at the time, there wasn't much around. There was few organizations that were doing this kind of work. Now you have dozens of organizations, INGOs such as Amnesty, um, HRW, you have news organizations who are now tasking companies like Planet Labs to, to, to do this kind of work. Um, and so Signal kind of came out in 2012 and 2013 was the idea that we need to modernize, we need to professionalize the sector, um, and we need to engage a broad audience. We need to engage with the private tech sector. We need to engage academia. We need to engage civil society groups and come together to understand how can we use these tools to do good while minimizing the potential for risks and, and, and harm. And so over, over the past decade, Signal's really built in um, a plethora of resources and documents from imagery, uh, imagery guides that can help you and help any organization learn how to use satellite imagery and how to use drone imagery to document burn structures, tuple structures, to build, um, to learn how to count and properly um, analyze damage to potential settlements or, or accounts um, refugee camps. But also critically, I think some of the work that Signal has done is to push the ethical um, and the, the, the guideline aspects. So Signal released in 2016, uh, what was called at the time, uh, the first iteration of the Signal code. And in it, it, it stipulates, it's a, it's a 20, 30 page document um, that looks into how do we bring, um, how do we bring operationalized ethical norms into the work um, that we're doing here. And so one of the things 
that um, and I'm I'm going to use some of the notes that Kayla shared since she's not able to 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 be here with us is that there's also a lot of limitations when using remote sensing and so while it's important to also be realistic to be excited about the work that you can do there's limitations to um, to the, to the access to the data so so oftentimes the environment that we want to use remote sensing in they're they're under mapped they don't have readily available data. Um, and so that makes it a little bit hard to do um, object identification or classification. And so typically what you want to do is, is you kind of want to see an image before an incident happened and an image after an incident happened and be able to compare and contrast to see um, to see what's happening. So you really need um, kind of these pre-training data sets to be available. And in, all, and in a lot of cases, they're not. Um, potentially was new and, and more um, access to commercial commercial data and a lot more locally driven um, initiatives, we can start closing this gap slowly and steadily um, to the point where we'll have enough data to be able to, to use um, across different contexts and environments. Um, the second point about remote sensing that, that's, that's exciting and also kind of challenging is that it's very contextual. Um, and by that, I mean, every environment has very specific type of um, taxonomies that they require to be able to properly analyze what's happening. But it also requires that you have access and, and working with the communities involved. Um, one of the dangers of doing this work is that you can be very much removed from the areas where the conflict is happening, where a humanitarian disaster is happening, where um, you know, threat to peace exists. And so the challenge becomes, you know, I'm sitting right now in, in Washington, DC, and the work that I've done um, the challenge becomes then, how do you connect with the communities on the ground? Because at the end of the day, it's very important that the communities on the ground, the people on the ground, be at the center of everything that we do. And so whether it's through collaborations, um, whether it's through involving them uh, every step of the way, however possible, um, it's critical to keep in mind that the context matters and that the communities involved matter tremendously. The second point um, that I've that I want to make is that it's also important to, to be very critical about what is it that we can achieve and what is it that we cannot. And so for a long time, I think there was this vision that being able to shed a light, being able to point a satellite image or a drone and capture imagery about an area where there's conflict can kind of act as a deterrent. Uh, what my colleague, Ms. Allen Raymond, likes to call the protective effect. And unfortunately, I think what we've learned and, and from my research is that there isn't that much of a protective effect. It doesn't seem to be as a deterrent to conflict. It doesn't seem to be a, a, a kind of a tool to stop abuses of human, human rights abuses or stop conflict. So instead, what we end up with is, is not a protective or a deterrent, but a tool to really document and collect um, evidence of acts um, that violate human rights that could potentially be war crimes. Um, and it's also documenting you know, disasters, humanitarian disasters happening um, as they unfold. And so while we think about the potential for remote sensing, uh, for satellite imagery, for machine learning and AI and all these tools, it's important to also understand and be, and be really critical about what is our, what are our series of change? What is it that we're trying to achieve? How do we go about achieving it? How do we engage the people who are most impacted um, by whether it's the conflicts, whether it's, it's, it's a lack of uh, whether it's a humanitarian disaster, whether it's a threat to their peace and livelihood, and how do we do this in a way that is safe, ethical, responsible? And there's a lot of, you know, I think in a Q&A, we'll be able to go into uh, some of these questions I'm happy to answer to, but there's a lot of big ethical questions. There's big concerns that a lot of the work that's being done traditionally has been done by, by Western external actors and there's a concern that we might be stepping into uh, what, what, what many are calling you know, a, a new form of colonialism. That's this data-driven uh, concept of data colonialism has grown over the last decade to be, really, um, to be really critical to the work that a lot of us are doing. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind a lot of these things. And um, one last point I wanna make before, before jumping is, is to also recognize that there's like excitement, but there's also concerns about potential that we might be driving into kind of a techno solutionist, solutionist, sorry, mentality where we get really excited about the technology to the detriment of what I call the social and vocal components, right? There's, there's, 
these are tools. Remote sensing is a tool to help us and help the people that we want to work with and help the communities to solve a problem. Uh, they're not a replacement to, 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 to politics. It's just social aspects of, of this work. And I think it's important to keep that in mind as the technologies evolve, as they become much more accessible to, to larger communities, to more people. And we just got to remember and keep our feet to the ground. Be realistic about what these tools can do, which is a lot of good, um, but also realize that there's a limit to what can be achieved and that we, we need to be um, we need to be honest and have a critical reflections about how technologies use can benefit peace builders. Um, how can it be used, for example, in um, in bringing people together, building communities, negoti uh, negotiating agreements? There's a lot that can be done. And I, at George Mason, some of my colleagues at the Carter School are looking into how we can use these tools and technologies and emerging tech um, to do this work. And, and the people at Signal have been doing this for, for a decade, and they're really at the cutting edge of, of this work. Um, I'll, I'll end it here. I'm, I'm glad to go into details uh, in the Q&A, but I think um, I'll let Eduardo go next, um, and then we can jump into question and answers. Great, Thank you, Ziad. Maybe sorry. just sorry, Eduardo. Just before Please, you Franca. start, I'll try to try to um, uh, just emphasize something that uh, uh, Ziad said, and this is exactly why we started uh, doing this uh, series of webinars, trying to really give a space for this honest discussion. So, so when we started talking about this topic, we exactly wanted to have this look uh, um, uh, into the previous 10 years. So from this uh, excitement about the technology uh, um, and, and the, the, the idea to actually uh, use this technology to protect populations towards the acknowledgement that maybe sometimes we are actually not in a position uh, to do that. And, and I would like to uh, um, try to maybe come back to this point when we start the discussion about this, uh, uh, probably familiar to many in the audience, uh, Amnesty International project on eyes on Darfur, when we actually thought that exactly these eyes uh, on, on uh, war crimes that are happening in Darfur will protect the populations and what we got is what it was completely the opposite uh, case of the uh, Bashir regime targeting exactly the villages that were monitored through through satellite imagery so this is this ethical dimension of this topic that is very important uh, to us and I'm uh, uh, really glad that Ziad brought this into discussion so let's come back to this in the Q&A but before this uh, Eduardo I'm giving the floor uh, to you um, and just to introduce you quickly to the audience um, so Eduardo is um, artificial uh, or machine learning engineer he works on artificial intelligence applications for humanitarian assistance and disaster response so so this is something that he will uh, represent to us today uh, as part of his work uh, at the United Nations Institute for Training. Come it looks on. like we may Two have lost second. Branca again, so why don't we just hand over to yeah, you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, go ahead. I'll share a few slides. Um, okay. Great. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all wherever you're connecting from. Um, my name is Eduardo Nemni and I'm working as machine learning researcher at UNICEF. Firstly, I'd like to thank um, Branka for inviting me. Thanks a lot also for Paige Arthur and a great talk from Ziad and I'm really looking forward for the Q&A. Uh, before we get started, I just have to do a quick disclaimer that I'm working as contractor for the United Nations. So what you will see today is my personal experience and point of view as researcher. So the question that we're trying to address today is what's the potential in combining high quality satellite imageries and deep learning to the humanitarian context. Before I'd like just to introduce UNICEF. Um, we are a program in the Division for Satellite uh, Analysis and Applied Research at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. And UNISAT has been operational since 2001. And we are one of the UN entities that is fully dedicated to satellite imagery analysis and capacity development. 
And we're very lucky and proud to be at CERN. And our IT and uh, AI group is based, uh, in fact, at the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Uh, UNICEF and partner John Lee develop algorithm in order to create operational pipeline. And we, as Branka said, I'm mainly focusing on AI and humanitarian assistance and disaster response, focusing on operational mapping. So UNICEF also provide feedback and assess the results and defines the usability. Sometimes you see great papers, AI papers in, in conference that uh, you have to uh, double check if they're good enough to be used in, in operations. Regarding human rights, UNICEF, as I said, is one of the most common provider of geospatial analysis and evidence in the UN system, and of course, especially satellite imageries. And uh, we had a long-term partnership with the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, UN Secretariat, and ICC, which is the International Criminal Court, and of course, other entities focus on documenting human rights violation and um, determine who is responsible and prosecuting individuals. Uh, and we're constantly conducting satellite imagery analysis on multiple large scales human rights validation around the world. And UNICEF an uh, analyst has testified three times at the ICC and uh, we have another one uh, coming soon. Uh, we are headquartered in Geneva, but we also have <coughs> few offices in uh, also bank, other offices in Bangkok and Nairobi, and we have a liaison office in New York. Um, as uh, Ziad said, there are benefit of satellite imagery. So I just want to go quickly over them and then uh, try to justify why we need another, another layer of complexity adding AI. So satellite imagery uh, provides objective information. They cover inaccessible areas, for instance, during flood events, and we will talk about flood soon. And they're near real time because at its best, you can get a daily update. And then you can monitor and access historical archive because most of them are passing through the same spot all over again. So you can have a time series while it's happening. There is a also high level details now, we have up to 30 centimeter resolution. In the example I'll show you with flood, we use 10 meter, but it's good to have the option of, of choosing 30 centimeter if needed. And they're also time stamped, which is key uh, during humanitarian context application. So why adding on top of it AI? In my opinion, you can map large events at scale instead of as possible and you can speed up humanitarian assistance and disaster response. However, there are limitations. I just want to talk about few limitations that I think they're really relevant. Those are all the some of the takeaways after, as practitioners and experts, we joined the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator Working Group that was specifically on, specifically on computer vision uh, for damage assessment. But I think the points are very valid on any AI project uh, on, on satellite imagery. So uh, most of the time there is a lack of labeled data. So as you can see on the top right, there is a drone image and you don't need only the image if you want to do AI, you need also the annotation. This means that around every single top uh, sorry, roof, you need on top of it a polygon that is exactly saying where the roof is. And this can be really costly if you have to do only for the AI paper uh, and AI model, um, or you can get some historical results. But regarding the historical results, for instance, at UNISAD, we do damage assessment, but we have four classes if you want to do um, damage assessment. We have a building can be undamaged, partially damaged, severely damaged, and destroyed. Then you go in another sources and find another NGO, um, and they're doing stuff differently. And when you want to merge to have a training data, then you have you know, different labels. How can you make them in a coherent way before starting training any algorithm? And also, again, talking about that image, that is a drone image from IOM. If you're training your data set, sorry, you're training your model on a data set that looks like this, but then in deployment, you're deploying the model on the one that it's um, on the bottom right, which is a normal, uh, let's say normal satellite imageries, then your model won't perform well. So there is also the availability during the emerger, emergency response. Maybe you find something online that is a drone image. You, you do some testing on this. It looks good. The performance are great, but then 
is it possible to have a drone going in every single place where you want to run your AI model? That's, a, uh, I think, a valid open question. And now let's assume we have an AI model. How do you deploy a heavyweight AI model in disaster setting? Are you hosting the AI model and you're just giving to uh, the beneficiaries just the, you know, the light results in a nice light format? Or are you going to deploy it to, uh, in the country? That's an open question again. Uh, maybe they don't have access to internet connection. Uh, maybe uh, it's hard to ship their GPU with the model. So that's an open question again. And how to personalize the AI assessment into existing emerg emergency response workflow where you have limited budget. Let's assume you're saving 80% of your time and money because you're using AI, but then the recipient is not ready to take that 80% that you're gaining leveraging AI because the workflow was not done uh, properly. You didn't integrate well the AI. You were saving on some in, in, at the beginning of the pipeline, but then you're losing because you didn't integrate it well. And then again, do we trust the AI? How to integrate the training validation loop into the operational? Uh, are you going to use for decision makers the AI outputs of the AI without any validation? Uh, do you think the AI is reliable? Do you need a quality control? So those are the really important questions before training and deploying an AI model, in my opinion. Now, I'll show you an example uh, on how at UNICEF we did and we're doing flood detection on satellite imagery. So you will see uh, a Sentinel, um, so this is a SAR imagery, it's a Sentinel-1 imagery. Uh, and then you will see, this is before the uh, flood strikes. Then you will see what happened when the flood strikes and then the segmentation that it's done. And by segmentation, I mean that an expert is annotating where the flood is. So the analyst, the geospatial analyst is able to extract in red, you see the flood, and then you see in blue, the permanent water. Permanent water usually is rivers, or it's lake and, and sea and so on. Are we trying, uh, sorry, are we able to automatize this? Um, we did it at UNISAT. We took the annotation that we had. We spent months uh, trying to make the annotation that were not, that not meant to be for AI into a data set. And now we have an end-to-end -end pipeline where let's say we focus on Mozambique. So we want to monitor Mozambique. We have a specific area of interest. Every single time there is a new images uh, covering Mozambique, it's automatically downloaded. It goes into our Unisat flood AI model. And then what about the output of the AI model? There is a human in the loop. So um, if it's just a one event, so we, we are trying to monitor, I don't know, 25th of January, what's, what's happening in Mozambique, there is a new man that is doing the quality control and the human validation before release. But when it goes, I said that AI is good because we can go at scale. What happens when we're going 100 images at a the time? Then we, we mark them as uh, AI generated. And then there is a random validation. So they, we know where the AI was not 100% sure, so we can go and the human can validate. And the geospatial analyst will give feedbacks both to the final product, but also you see the arrow that says fine tuning a model update is because I'm, I'm, I'm taking the AI, uh, sorry, the output from the analyst, and uh, that uh, will, will act as feedback to the model to increase the performances of the model. And this pipeline is hosted at the moment at CERN. So when I was talking, are we hosting or are we giving, we're, we're currently deciding that we, we will host and give uh, the maps to the partners and user. So those are automatically generated over Mozambique in January by an AI. And the AI model um, uh, was already used back in uh, August in Bangladesh, but then it's now operational um, since 2021, and we monitored the entire month uh, over Mozambique. And the, the one that I think is very interesting is the one on the right. So uh, the one on the right says that is uh, from in Sofala region, uh, province, sorry, from the 14th to the 23rd. Thirst. So it's a 15 days uh, cumulative analysis that is really time consuming if you have to do it with a semi-automated way and with a geospatial analyst annotating the map. And we were monitoring the entire month uh, with AI. And when at the end of the month, uh, UN OCHA was their office asked us for a cumulative, we just had to merge the shape files and we were ready uh, in a few hours. 
uh, how can you leverage uh, even more? So we were we are testing this dashboard where <clears throat> at the at the center you see that was a uh, uh, back in 2019. Uh, that's a testing dashboard. Um, so at the center you have the flood extraction, but then we wanted to give information about the flood. So on the right you see the total population divided by administrative level, so by province, by region. Uh, on the left, you can see the impact statistics um, that the flood had on the infrastructure. So how many kilometers of road were affected, primary roads, secondary roads. And this is very important to prioritize humanitarian relief during the operation. Um, another example is refugee settlement mapping. So there are millions of people that are currently in a refugee camp. And satellite images are crucial to monitor and map internal displaced people, IDP, and refugee camps. However, since the manual process of clicking on each shelter is costly, time consuming, and limited to one point per shelter, you can, I mean, you can even, you can even do like a, um, a polygon around each shelter, but it's even more costly. Then CERN Open Lab, uh, UNISAT, and UN Global Poles develop a pipeline that automatically detects shelter from satellite imagery. And since the UN decision depends on this analysis, the required precision has to be really high, above 95%. Um, this is pool satellite. So concerning a broader project on refugee settlement mapping, UNISAT and UN Global Poles develop pool satellite. It's a collaboration tool using human AI interaction to analyze satellite imagery. Uh, using AI assistance, we believe that is a reasonable strategy to transition from current fully manual operational pipeline to ones which are both more efficient and have the necessary level of quality control. It also allow an evaluation on the fly in order to help the analysts determine whether the assessment quality is good enough or released. I'll show you a very quick video of pool satellite over Zatari settlement in Jordan. As you can see, there is a bonding box and also segmentation around um, each shelter that was detected. If you want to know more about this tool, there is a great paper from a colleague at UN Global Polls, uh, and I'll send you the link later. It's uh, Logar et al. from uh, uh, 2019. It's a, it's a great paper. Um, so again, about shelter detection, this is a uh, Northwest Syria, um, uh, an IDP settlement, and this area was very much in the news back in 2019, and it was under assault. So it was resulting in lots of IDP movement, and we were mapping this as, uh, as part of which. And we used pool satellite, and we located 2,500 structure in the overall area, which is, it was bigger than, than the one displays on the, on the screen. Um, and this is versus the 1,800 shelter manually mapped the year before, which took an hour in general. And um, for both uh, data production and review, it took around 15 minutes with the pool satellite. So, um, of course, there is a significant time and cost savings realized um, and faster results provided to our partner reach. But we also we can also update the analysis more often and more frequently with less effort. And uh, last but not least, I think there is a difference in the workflow for the analyst, uh, and it's, uh, the workflow is less tedious and more interesting, and it goes uh, at a faster pace. So uh, UNICEF is focused on operational pipeline, and we need high quality results, and we need it fast. So the limitations shown in the previous slide are extremely true when trying to automate tasks where the human eye is doing a better job, such as damage assessment, change detection for peacekeeping, and conflict detection. Um, regarding fire detection, for instance, um, they are collected globally via satellite imagery several times a day, and they offer a precise um, coordinates and date stamp, providing a way to identify where the violent conflict is occurring. However, unfortunately, large number of fire detection are recorded daily. Um, and in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for instance, in 2019, there were 459,000 fire detection via satellite imagery. Um, and at the present, the only way to review the fire detection for the purpose of conflict assessment is largely through our manual review, which is not practical. 
So UNICEF believes that through combining satellite imageries and artificial intelligence, it's now possible to build a system that separates between the man-made and the natural fires, enabling an early real-time warning system for conflict-related fire detection. Uh, and the solution that we have is creating new data set for AI model using uh, historical data, both UNICEF, but other, also other sources historical data, and then gener uh, generating synthetic satellite imageries. This is a very interesting project that we're doing with CERN. Um, we don't have data set for certain thing that we want to do. So we decided to create our own data set with our own annotation and to use them then to train AI to do the tasks that we like to do. Uh, and of course, it's key to strengthen the, the partnership to do so. So in conclusion, the effectiveness of AI-based methodology relies on the ability to provide more timely and accurate update. But looking forward, we are still uh, focused on high quality result, uh, results del uh, del del delivered in timely fashion. And we're actually exploring AI for damage assessment, change detection for peacekeeping, and also uh, culture, cultural, cultural sorry, heritage site. Um, a very important point here is that AI does not replace the analyst. Uh, it rather augments them and lets them produce more. So we're, we're very aware that we're barely scratching the surface of IDP analysis, for instance. And so AI will help us to get closer uh, to map, in this case, 100% of IDPs or refugees. And in general, we hope that AI will bring us closer to a full mapping. Thanks a lot. Uh, if you want to know more, um, looking forward for the Q&A, you can send me a message and you can find more information here at unita.org slash UNICEF. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Eduardo. And I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, Branca has asked me to take over for the Q&A. So we have been collecting actually quite a few um, questions, um, but I just wanted to say, Eduardo, that I really appreciated in your presentation how you um, worked through um, different ideas of application. So really starting from the humanitarian side and then thinking about how we can build on what's already been pioneered um, in that side of the work, particularly at the UN, and then be used for prevention and peace building because it is a very open space, but open spaces are can be very big and it's hard to know where to start. So I really thank you for, for bringing those ideas about using damage assessment, um, even this idea around tracking fires and distinguishing between man-made and natural fires, just bringing some ideas for how this might actually work. So. Just turning now to the questions, I've been trying to group them together. There have been quite a few questions about accountability and I guess how you actually make that connection between what is being read in the images and then going to hold either individuals or, or governments to account. Um, and so I wonder if both of you could reflect on that a bit and just specifically within that, we had a question from Hank Jan Brinkman at the Peace Building Support Office about you know, the point that holding perpetrators to account, of course, requires identification of individuals. Um, and this is not something that typically can be done through satellite imagery. So what's the process by which it contributes to an accountability proce process? Because I'm sure it's one piece of evidence among others. And then similarly, we had a, a question from Margot at Justice Rapid Response about the extent to which satellite imagery is currently being used in international investigations and whether there's a lot more space for that. And she actually referenced things such as commissions of inquiry. Um, is this a tool that um, such commissions kind of have the expertise to use and, and have been using or should be using more? Um, and then we also have Boyan um, Francis from CIC Pathfinders, who's actually asked some interesting questions about how governments have reacted to the idea of that they might be surveilled 24 seven. So how has that changed behaviors, whether for the good or for the bad um, in terms of how governments are reacting to now being held, account and held to account in a different way? Um, so let me turn that back over to you. And I don't know which of you wants to go first, but feel free to answer any of those, any of those questions. I can, I can go first on the questions of you know, accountability and, and 
and bringing this to court? Um, that's a really, really great and very important question that I wish I had a direct answer to. Uh, the reason being is that there's not too many cases. Um, and we don't have too many legal um, material to, to go to, 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 to show how satellite imagery has been directly used to then point towards accountability of a, of a war crime of a human rights violation. Um, I, I'm assuming there's a few legal experts as participants. And I think one of the critical aspects when using satellite imagery to then be able to bring it into court is the chain of custody needs to be maintained from point A from you know the start of the data collection all the way through the analysis and bringing it up to court. So everything from you know what you know what satellite took the image, what you know timestamp locations, you know the analyst that analyzed it, um, if it was an AI model, you know the algorithms that were used, the decision making. There's all these steps that have to be maintained. Um, to then be even to get to the point of being admissible into court, um, I know here in the U.S. there's a you know the space law is more focused on like damage assessment for insurance purposes, um, and so there is some cases of that, but it's not for accountability of human rights to the degree um, that I think many of us would like it to see. I, I know there's some cases um, being brought forward, um, so I think accountability from a legal standpoint that's that's one thing, but I think there's also the aspect of accountability from a social um, communitarian and political standpoint, I think there's a lot more that's done there. Um, I, I know there's been work that's also being done to able to preserve uh, the data that's being generated and collected. So whether it's through satellite imagery um, or drone imagery, or even you know a lot of use of videos uh, in conflicts like in Syria, you know we have I don't know how many terabytes of data that's being generated each each month to collect that data. Um, so there are some initiatives that are being done to collect data to be able to have it um, brought forth into a case. But uh, like I think Hank said, you need the individuals to be able to bring the case forward. You need to be able to identify the links, and I think that's the challenge. Um, that's that's a critical challenge that I think we're moving towards that point, and I I think we'll get to it. Um, but I think at first we need we need these cases to go up. To go into court, um, and we need people to bring up these cases so that we can have some language uh, and some kind of precedence that then can be built upon. I can give you my point of view. I mean, I'm an AI researcher, so I will I will tell you my point of view. I know because I I talk with a colleague who, as as I said in the talk, we are testifying at the ICC that the first step is. To see if a violation happened and then who, but that's that's a second stage. However, I just want to to give you a, a quick personal point of view on AI. So I don't see the AI at, at any point to be brought at court and use AI as um, the tool that will prove that there is a human rights violation. I personally believe that that's a tool. So we have to remember that as satellite imagery is a tool to prove human rights violation, AI is a tool to prove and actually to spot more quickly, in a, in a quicker way, sorry, if there is. So AI can help us in early uh, warning system or in monitoring a situation where, as I said, you have 459,000 uh, fire det uh, detection. How can you see among them which are the one to spot? Even if we can move 459,000 to 100, and then an analyst will go through and validate them, then I think it's a great achievement on the on the AI side. Thanks very much for that. I mean, I think one of the uh, so one of the other issues that that both of you raised was around the issue of of partnership. Um, sort of how to move this forward. Um, you know, I think that uh, this is one of the things that I heard from a presentation from the European Space Agency, you know, around their Sentinel initiative. And, you know, they're wondering themselves, how can we partner with others in order to make this useful for people doing prevention and peace building? They're looking for people from the peace building and prevention side to give them the ideas and bring the ideas to them. So I wonder from your perspective in terms of what those partnerships um, could look like in the future. What were you? What would you prioritize? Um, where do you think the the most important partnerships um, need to be need to come from first? I'll go first this time. Uh, I think 
I can talk about AI. So I believe that, for instance, uh, satellite imagery, if they open source, like Sentinel One. So all the flat mapping work that I presented is done on Sentinel One, and now we're expanding on Sentinel Two. Copernicus, they're 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 open source. So it means that uh, I can write a Python script that automatically detects every new image and and pull it, which is great because then I can work with a lot of data and I don't have to you know pay for for every single. Um, image. So I think, uh, I mean, ESA with Copernicus is doing great because once it's open source, then you can you can create pipelines. Um, and then I think if you want to do AI, you have to remember that you need a lot of space to store because satellite images are very, very um, uh, big to store. And then you need cloud uh, computing because you cannot deploy and actually train at the beginning. And it's very expensive. Uh, you go on AWS, you train a model, it's very expensive. And I feel there is um, there is a barrier at the moment because is it user friendly to go to put all your data in a bucket and to start running your AI model? And when you have it, you you have to deploy this somewhere. How are you gonna deploy it? So I think you have like us as practitioner, we have to partner with both a provider of cloud computing, but also people who can help us to manage. And we are very lucky that we are at CERN. So we are not uh, very concerned about storage because I mean, we have terabyte of space. And then we, we were lucky enough to have CERN Open Lab who is part of a bigger organization and partnership. And they were providing us free credits to run our, our um, our training model. So I think those two are very important. And then the last point I want to make is you have to design it well from the beginning. So as was, as mentioned before, you really have to look forward and know how you're going to deploy in the model. Because if you do something on drone images, but then you don't think that at the end of the day, you need drones image to deploy the model, then that model won't be useful. And the same for the damage assessment, you have to partner. So there are many AI papers that for instance does, um, they do damage assessment with two classes. Uh, I think, are they useful? That's an open question. At UNICEF we do with four classes. So we have to, you know, partner UNICEF and, and any UN organization with university as well. So we can talk before months and months of training. So uh, at UNICEF, one of my colleagues, geospatial analysts can say, I will use any AI model and damage assessment only if there are four classes. And then the people at the university will do the training only with four classes, because even if you have 99% uh, accuracy with two classes, I'm sure that then it won't, it won't be used. So that's, I think, uh, communication is, is important beforehand. Any thoughts from your side, Dion? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk on the conflict resolution, peace building kind of aspects. Uh, everything Gordon said, absolutely agree. I think that one of the big things that are missing, maybe not the right word, but I think we need we need a better understanding of what we want from each other, right? Uh, you know, the, the team at Warrior works with, they need to understand better what somebody on the ground might need. Somebody on the ground needs to understand what are the technical possibilities that Eduardo's team needs. So some of these collaborations need to be more about also learning about the tools, but also being kind of going back to the point, having a realistic understanding of what you can do and, and can achieve. You know, I've seen all these partnerships that get developed and then they shut down two, three years later. Oftentimes it's because there's a mismatch in expectations and what the goals and values uh, of these projects are. The other aspect, you know, from the conflict and peace builder side is the funding, right? You, you get into these projects, you have an initial funder that's interested that will fund you to do maybe a pilot study for a year or two. Um, and then the funding kind of goes away. So you have a lot of these projects that get started and then don't go anywhere. Um, and it's unfortunate because we lose a lot of this knowledge um, that doesn't really get shared. And so one of the things that I'm a big advocate for is, is failure, is, is knowledge sharing about failures, right? Learning what did not work is, is oftentimes as important as knowing what worked. And I think we don't do as good of a job of sharing this knowledge throughout the sectors. And I think opportunities like this, like these kind of dialogues are really important. Like I've been in this field for a decade and I've learned something from Eduardo today. And I can only imagine somebody who, who's trying to get into this field, they need they need these kind of opportunities. We need to also be able to speak to each other in a way that's build these common knowledges. You know, Eduardo mentioned this classification system. We worked at Signal, we developed this classification system that's 
you know, that's contextual, right? It's three by three, so it's three, it's three cases, and each case has three different identification models. And so we need these commonalities, we need these, these common frameworks if we want to be able to build on each other's work. And I think the biggest issue that oftentimes peace builders find themselves in in conflict resolution and humanitarian is that we end up wasting valuable resources recreating the wheel. So how do we work to, 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 to stop these redundancies? How do we build models that, 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 that work and can scale up and are sustainable is, is critical. Um, and it starts like Eduardo said, from the get-go, having these discussions, working with the partners throughout every single, throughout the whole setup from from designing a specific model all the way to the application and being and being critical about you know what is it that we can achieve you know I, I still think there's a promise in early warning i think oftentimes what's missing is the infrastructure okay so we, we can get a model that tells us you know there's potential conflict that's or there's movement of troops or there's xyz risk but then how does that translate on the ground who are the partners on the ground how do you respond and oftentimes we're doing this in an environment where the people on the ground are governments or, or armed rebel groups who actually don't want you to do this work or, or get you know get the message to the people on the ground. And so I think we need more of these conversations, more of these partnerships, they're critical. Um, and the more we can do them, I think the better it is um, for the field. Thanks a lot, Ziad. And I think um, we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to give, um, actually, a, there were a couple of very practical short questions for Eduardo. So I wanted to, and I just uh, lost them, but kind of quickly, since it would just take 15 seconds, um, there was someone who wanted to know if UNISAT makes any of the training data available on GitHub or some other place. And then also if there's a paper on the topic, just quickly to you. Yeah, I sent few now a few sources on uh, yeah uh, flood mapping all the all the publication we have done, and regarding GitHub um, and data sources, we are working on that. Uh, we are thinking on doing a challenge, and during the challenge, we uh, open source all the all the data set. They are very big. We're cleaning the data set in order to think how we can. I cannot give a two terabyte of data to a person on the laptop, so we are cleaning before releasing. Thanks a lot. So just in closing, I just wanted to combine actually the, the final comments from Ziad and Eduardo on partnership. And I think what it signals actually is the level of complexity of this kind of undertaking and making sure that that's not underestimated um, in terms of thinking about how we can make this practical and workable for people who are working in the peace building and conflict prevention field. It's a long-term multi-stakeholder process that needs a significant level of investment. Um, so I, I really like to see the, this, the kind of point that you made that we need a better understanding of what we want from each other and that kind of dialogue. And it's really for that reason that we've been trying to bring these groups together who are coming from very different perspectives. I think it's very important for peace builders and, and people working in the conflict prevention space to understand, for example, Eduardo, the level of complexity and the technical process to get where you need to be um, in order to make this, this practical and workable. So, um, so I want to thank both of you very much for enlightening us today, for contributing to this dialogue um, and hope that we could welcome you again at some point in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks to Branka for organizing this. Thank you to the um, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs as always for support. And thanks to all of you for joining. Thank you for having us. I shared a couple of links that could be helpful for anybody. Thanks for having us. Bye guys. Thanks. And we'll share the recording with, with everybody as well. Thanks a lot. Take care.